Hi everybody, it's great to be here. I, um, I've been a bit jet lagged, so I've been waking up at 3 a.m. every day since arriving on Friday. Hopefully I don't fall asleep in the afternoon session, so we'll see, uh, we'll see where I'm up to at that point, but uh, this morning I feel good and ready to go. So this is the title of this section of slides here, so I've divided up my presentation into about six sections. And in between this, the lecture parts, I have a few example questions that you can work on and I can just wander around and help you out if you need any help. Um, and we'll go, hopefully in a fairly logical order, through some topics in probability theory and Bayesian data analysis. So this is my affiliation and my website. Um, I work at a department of statistics, but I used to be an astronomer. When I did my PhD, which was about 10 years ago now, I submitted it and the, re the referee's reports came back and they said something like, yep. Those people who have a problem with the connection, Aaron, he's here, he's gonna come and see your computer one by one. So just raise your hand when he's done, just raise your hand and the closest person he's gonna go. Okay, yep. So when the referee reports came back on my PhD thesis, they said, yeah, good thesis, I think it can pass. But it seems like you don't actually care that much about astronomy, you care more about the statistics. And I was like, yeah, fair call. Um, and, and then I did an astronomy postdoc and then I ended up you know, applying for jobs in statistics. So I guess it was a bit inevitable. Um, so I'm kind of a bit in both worlds, but more in the statistics world these days. Everything that I'm gonna present is available in a GitHub repository, which you can clone if you know how to use Git. So this is the URL that you can clone from, and what it has in there is all the slides, or actually Beamer source code for all the slides, but it should be pretty easy to compile if you want to look at the slides. It has code, Python code, for doing Metropolis and nested sampling, which I'll be covering later in the day. And it also contains um, LaTeX source code for the question PDFs, which are the questions that we'll be working on. So everything is in that URL. Make sure you use recursive, because some of the stuff that's in there is actually from another, another um, Git repository, and so you need to get that kind of sub-module as well. So I'll just leave that up for a couple more seconds. Okay. Also, if you want some book recommendations and things, I've got this web page, which is not for, not for the purpose of this school necessarily. This is actually a web page that I set up for my research students in Auckland because I realized that every time I took on a new research student, I was recommending them exactly the same books, exactly the same papers, and things like that. So I thought it might be handy to you to have a this link as well so that you can check out what books I like and what books you could go to to learn more about the subjects that I'm going to talk about today. Okay. So in this first part of my part of the of the day or, or first part of my part of the course is on probability. Now how many of you would say you're pretty comfortable with probability theory? Uh, many of you comfortable with probability theory? Do you only know a little bit? Okay. So this this first set of le this first lecture is on probability, which is a mathematical framework that is just a set of rules from which you can derive things, and you can, can think about probabilities in kind of three different ways. There's a kind of abstract mathematical way of thinking about probability, which is to just think of it as probability is what you're studying when you're studying these equations that we'll see soon. And that's the kind of maybe the way a mathematician would think about probability is just those sets of equations that work like that. And if you're working with that, then you're doing probability. That's a bit pure mathematical. When you want to apply it, and you do want to apply it a lot in statistics and in data analysis, you need to have some kind of understanding of what it is that your probabilities in your equations 
what it is that they are being used to model. And there's two main applications of probability that are out there. And both of them are useful, but one of them is kind of the one I'm going to emphasize in, in this course, which is the Bayesian one, which I've actually put here as number two, which is that you can use probabilities to model degrees of certainty about statements or degrees of plausibility of statements. How likely is it that I had pizza for dinner last night? Okay. How likely is it that I'll have pizza again for dinner tonight? I think that's probably a zero. It depends on what you had yesterday. Yeah, it depends, depends as well. How could we make a model where we put those two things in to, into the problem and make them dependent? All that kind of stuff is what we're going to look at this morning. So the other application of probability is to describe sets or um, proportions of sets. So things like 30% um, of men are taller than 6 feet, say. So x% percent of some set has property y. That is another use of probability theory, and that's more associated with the kind of frequentist idea. It has to do with relative frequency. How common is, is some property within some set? So both of these are valid applications of probability theory, um, but we're going to emphasize the second one because when you use probability theory in this way, you develop what's called Bayesian statistics, and it's a good way of understanding how statistical methods work and what they're founded upon so that when you are using say some machine learning method later in the week it gives you a way of thinking about it even if probability might not necessarily be in that machine learning um, method that you're using it gives you a way of thinking about it and saying ah oh, this machine learning method that I have or this data analysis method it's like if I was doing a Bayesian analysis with this set of assumptions so even if you're not going to explicitly use probability to do everything in your work, it's good to know what it would look like if you were to do it this way, and it gives you a good way of thinking about other methods. So there's two rules, basically, that define probability theory. And there's some notation and, and things that we'll have to learn in order to use these two rules of probability theory. So, since we're talking about Bayesian probability theory here, we're going to use um, our symbols X, Y, and Z on this slide. Those are going to represent statements or propositions. So those are like sentences that might be true or false. And you don't know whether the sentences are true or false, necessarily. So maybe the one about whether I had pizza last night um, could be called X. And then you might have other propositions or statements, y and z. And the sum rule and the product rule tell us how the probabilities of those statements relate to each other. So I'll just read out this first equation, which is the sum rule. And as I read it out from left to right, uh, hopefully I'll be able to introduce what, each, what everything means in the notation and what this what this equation is mostly used for and why it is the way that it is. So starting from the left-hand side, I'm saying that the probability of this statement here, which is x or y, that v means or, logical or, so that's like the same or that you would have in a programming language. So if you go false or false, that's false. False or true, that's true. So it's the same kind of or as that. The probability of x or y given z, the vertical bar means given, or which means assuming that z is true or conditional on z is another way of saying it. It's equal to the probability of x given z, which is how, how, how likely is it that x is true under the assumption that z is true plus the probability of y given z minus the probability of x and y given z. 
So I'm using the comma to denote and, and that's the logical and like you would have in a programming language where if you have something that's true and something that's false and you and them together, since they're not both true, the result would be false. So this applies for any three statements or propositions x, y, and z. And one thing to notice about this equation is that it's got given z in every single term. And what that means is that you can kind of think of z as being the context or the, the background assumption that this whole equation, everything in this equation assumes that z is true. So another way of writing it would be to write it all down without the given z in it. So what this is typically used to model is the fact that if you have a proposition that you are interested in, did I, ha did I have pizza last night? Say that's x. Okay. And say that y is the proposition that I had cereal for dinner last night. Then the probability that I had either pizza or cereal, one of those, will have something to do with the sum of the probabilities of pizza and the probability of cereal. And what this represents is the fact that the more you enlarge the definition of something, or the more, uh, the more broad something is, some proposition, the more you use logical or to attach other ways um, or other ways in which the whole thing could be true to a proposition, the probability has to go up. So if I say the probability I ate pizza is 50%, then the probability I ate pizza or cereal has to be bigger than 100 has to be bigger than 50%. So that's why you get the plus in here. Okay, so that's the sum rule. Usually what it's for is, its most common use is to get the probability of propositions that are defined using logical or. If, you, if, if some value, say x might be 1, 2, or 3, then the probability that it's 1 will be some number. The probability is 1 or 2. You'll get it by adding in extra probability. So that's usually what the sum rule is for. We've also got the product rule. And usually the product rule is used to calculate the probability that two propositions are both true at the same time, loosely speaking. Though, of course, time, there's no time in probability theory, really. So if we had, if x was about pizza and y was about cereal, and I wanted to know the probability that both x and y were true, so that I had cereal and that I had pizza, then I can decompose that. I can first say, well, what's the probability I had pizza? And then, what's the probability I had cereal, given that I had pizza, and multiply those two together? Okay. So that's the product rule. And everything in probability theory is derived from applications of these two things. So it doesn't necessarily look, look like it, look like you're using these things when you are using them. So we'll see Bayes' rule soon, and Bayes' rule comes from the product rule. Okay, to remember them, and also to define t some, uh, some terminology as well, these are the kind of easier to remember versions of the sum and product rules. So the sum rule, again, this is the one that's usually to do with or. Probability of x or y is the probability of x plus the probability of y. And I've done two things to get from equation one to three. The first is that I've dropped given z from every term. I've just let whatever the kind of background context of all these terms is just be removed from the notation, just to make it easier. And I've left off the last term, the probability that x and y are both true. And what that means is that this version of the sum rule is specialized to the case where x and y are alternatives. They can't both be true at the same time. So one example is, um, did I eat three slices of pizza or four slices of pizza? Can't be both three and four, so they would be mutually exclusive. That's what it means, they can't both be true. They're alternatives, and so you drop off that third term, it becomes zero. 
simpler version of the product rule is this one. So it's like equation two here, but I've just dropped given z from every single term. It goes away, just pretend that it's gone into the background of the whole thing. And so the probability that both x and y are true is the probability of x times the probability of y given x. And that's true in general. <coughs> now, the way that, it's, that, that the product rule usually gets used in practice is that instead you use something called Bayes' rule, which is based on decomposing the probability of x and y in two different ways. So here I wrote that probability of x and y is the probability of x times probability of y given x. But I could have done it the other way around. I could have done first the probability of y and then multiply by the probability of x given y. So I could have written it the other way around. I would get two expressions that are equal and then I could rearrange them a bit. And then traditionally, instead of writing x and y, we write h and d because the interpretation is going to become important. But when you do that, you get the Bayes rule, which is this which says that the probability of some statement h given some statement d is the probability of h times the probability of d given h divided by the probability of d. And the interpretations of h and d and the reason for the choice of h and d as the two letters for these statements is that h stands for a hypothesis and d stands for data. So. One example might be if H is the hypothesis that I had pizza for dinner and D is the hypothesis that I was actually asleep at 8 p.m. for jet lag reasons and that we're in Spain, then you could, uh, you could calculate the probability of the hypothesis of interest conditional on the data that's known use this formula and the way that we think of it is that we're updating the probability to take into account the information D. Because if we're interested in some hypothesis H here, we would have had some prior probability, this is called a prior probability, it's the probability that H was true, not conditional on D, so not taking D into account, times this thing and divided by that thing and you get the probability that H is true given D, which means taking D into account. So this use of Bayes' theorem to do updating is the, kind of, is the foundation of Bayesian statistics. Yep. Yep, D is data. Yep. Can you just wait a second? Thank you. So, data, you said the prob probability of the data, but yeah. we need a kind of hypothesis, no? So, how um, we are we going to get the, the. So, data is just data. So, Maybe it's do you mean question. that in order to calculate this, so this is usually the output that you want? I know this data, I want to know how it affects. How, what, how plausible that hypothesis is. Yeah, but only the PD, um, how do you uh, get that? I'm going to get to that in a few minutes. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in order to use this, you have to make certain assumptions about what these are and how to calculate these and where those come from, which I'll get to in a couple of minutes. So I'll do an example, which I think will hopefully show what what's going on and will show many features of, of Bayesian inference that carry through to, to bigger problems as well. Some terminology that you need to know, one of them I already mentioned on the other slide is that if, any, if there are two statements and they can't both be true, then they, they are called mutually exclusive and that means that the sum rule just turns into this, so you don't have that minus something or other on the right-hand side. So to get x or y, you just add the two probabilities. And there's something that is, there's, there's another property which is called independence, which 
says that if I learned that one of my statements was true, that wouldn't affect what I think about the other one. So if two statements are independent, if you have the probability of x and the probability of y, then to get the probability of x and y, you just multiply those two probabilities. So this is the product rule. It's the same as equation 4, but on the right-hand side, instead of having the probability of y given x as the second term, I've just written the probability of y. And if probability of y and probability of y given x are the same thing, then that means they're independent, it means that learning x is irrelevant to y. So independence arises all over the place. Actually, it turns out that you know, so much stuff is independent that that's, that turns out to be a reason why it's even possible to apply Bayesian data analysis in practice. Because when you work on a problem, the fact that you can ignore almost everything else apart from just that little problem is to do with independence. If you thought it was relevant, you would have to put it in. The fact that you think it's irrelevant means you can leave it out. Okay. So the basic setup for most Bayesian uh, data analysis situations or most Bayesian inference situations is to take this Bayes rule here, but instead of just applying it to a single hypothesis H, so you have some data D, a single hypothesis H, and you work out the probability of H given D. Instead of that, the most, use, the most popular way of using this formula is to apply it to a series of hypotheses H. So you would replicate this equation uh, for each different hypothesis you were considering. And what you end up with is this version of Bayes' rule, which was actually first written down by Laplace, I believe. Um, so I don't actually know that much about the Reverend Bayes, but I think most of what we call Bayesian statistics was actually from Laplace. And he wrote down something like this, which is the probability of hypothesis I given some data D, and we're just using a single proposition for our data. We're using one data proposition to update our probabilities for all of the hypotheses that we care about, so for a bunch of HIs. A different i. So posterior probability here, which is the one that means, so that's the posterior probability is the updated one, the one that's conditional on d, equal the prior probabilities for each hypothesis times this thing for each hypothesis divided by a p of d that's actually common to all of the, the um, all of the hypotheses because this summation sums over all sums over i so that you get one number on the denominator that applies to all the equations that you have and that would give you all the posterior probabilities so the terminology for all the terms are that all of the p of h i's are the prior probabilities so if you enumerate a set of possible answers to a question and you assign a probability to each one and all those probabilities have to be positive numbers that add up to one. Those are all the prior probabilities. These terms here, for each of the hypotheses, you need to decide if, if that hypothesis was true, how likely would it be that I would observe this data? And all of these terms are called the likelihoods. Basically, how well does each hypothesis predict the data that was actually observed? And you consider that as a function of the hypothesis. And then this thing on the denominator is called the marginal likelihood, or a lot of physicists call it the evidence. And some people have started calling it fully marginalized likelihood, or FML, which is, it also has an internet meaning. Um, so that's quite amusing. Uh, so, so this is the terminology for all these terms, and how we get them is a, a, a kind of big topic. So usually the way people assign prior probabilities is that they assume something about prior ignorance or about prior data that they want to take into account. So 
if you're considering 10 possible hypotheses and before getting the data you were very uncertain, you might assign probability 1 over 10, so equal to all of your 10 hypotheses. That's a common way of choosing the values of these. Choosing the values of these likelihoods is often easy because the definition of the hypotheses usually says something about what data you would expect to see. And we'll see that more uh, when we get to the examples. And it turns out that you have to choose the values for this, for these terms, values for these terms, and you don't have to choose values for the denominator here, because once you've chosen these and these, um, that's just a sum over all of them. And so you don't have to assign it, you have to just calculate it. So the assumptions you have to put in are assumptions about these terms, assumptions about those terms, and the rest is a calculation. Okay. So I thought I'd work through an example now, which is quite simple. It's just a problem with two hypotheses. And this I first wrote this a few years ago when there was the evolved topical, but now it's just showing that I'm recycling a bit. Uh, so sorry about that, but I think it's a, it's a good question. And it's the kind of question that is usually used to introduce Bayes' theorem and, and Bayesian inference. Um, so a patient goes to the doctor, they have a fever, and we want to know whether they have Ebola or whether they do not have Ebola. So that very question leads us to write down its possible answers, which are, yes, the patient has Ebola, which I'll call H, H for hypothesis. And the alternative to that hypothesis is that the patient does not have Ebola. So, if, so anytime you, you care about one hypothesis or one proposition that may or may not be true, you also are defining its negation, and the symbol for negation is this, this little thing here. So the negation of H is the denial of H, or the, the proposition that H is false. So, this, so it looks like you could use Bayes' theorem just once, but really we almost always use it in this form for a set of hypotheses where at the very least you have the negation of the one that you care about. So even if it looks like you only have a single hypothesis, you actually have two. Okay, so we have to define, in order to use this version of, of Bayes' theorem, we have to define prior probabilities, how plausible is it that H is true, and how plausible is it that H is false? Our second hypothesis is the negation. So you have to choose numbers, and you have to choose numbers between 0 and 1. And these numbers are modeling something about your state of uncertainty when you don't have the data. You don't know the result of what's, what's in this question. It's going to be a, a test. So you just have to pluck numbers out of the air. And you might pluck numbers out of the air like 50-50. It's like, I, this situation is like flipping a coin. Or you might have some prior information which leads you to assign numbers that are different from 50-50. And in this context, I think it makes sense to assign a low prior probability that the patient has Ebola. And for argument's sake, I'm just going to give it a value of 0 0.01. Sorry? Of, in this question, a very good way to get a probability for a particular individual having a disease is to look at the frequency of occurrence in the population. Yeah, that's a good... That's usually just... Uh, in these kinds of questions, it's usually just assumed that those two things are the same number. Um, I want to emphasize that the, the plausibility that one person has a disease and the frequency with which that disease exists in the population are two different concepts, even though you might assign them the same value. But probability theory applies to both of them. OK. So if it's 0.01 for H, then it must be 0.99 for not H. And that's going to be, those are, that's our prior distribution that describes our ignorance before we had any data. OK. 
So they take a test, the test isn't perfect, it usually gives them the right answer, but sometimes it just flips to the wrong answer. So I'm going to define this statement D, or this proposition, as being the proposition that the test came back saying it was Ebola, and the negation of D is the proposition the test says it's not Ebola. And if we had a perfect test, then we could write down all of our likelihoods, the probability of getting of the test saying the patient has Ebola, given that they do, would be one. Saying that they don't, given that they do, would be zero. Saying that they do, given that they don't, would be zero. And saying that they don't, given that they don't, would be one. So this is the way of, of getting the likelihoods, is that you think that you, you imagine that you knew the answer to your question. You know that the hypothesis is true because you have to define probabilities that are conditional on that hypothesis. So you can assume that it's true and then think about how the data comes about and that usually is a good way of getting some values for these terms. If I knew that H was true and I was trying to predict what the test would say, what would I write down? A simple assumption for how a test would work if it's not perfect is that instead of these numbers being 1 and 0, they are something close to 1 but not equal to 1, and something close to 0 but not equal to 0. So this assumption I'm making here is that whatever the true state of the, of the patient is, having or not having Ebola, they, um, the test gives the right answer with probability 95%, and the test gives the the wrong answer with probability 5%. So this is just a replacement of the zeros and ones I had on the previous slide with 0.95 and 0.05. So it's just a 5% chance that the test flips the truth. So if we consider our, if we consider just our H, our proposition that they have Ebola, and our not H, H and not H, it seems like we only have two possibilities. So if we look just at our H's, we have two possibilities. If we look, though, at our combinations of H with D, we actually have four propositions in this problem that are mutually exclusive, not two. So there's H and not H, but there's H and D, not H and D, H and not D, and not H and not D. And so this is a common feature in Bayesian statistics problems, even if you get to more advanced problems, people will think about the parameter space. Those are, that's the set of possible values of the parameters that you're trying to estimate, and I'll get to that in the next section if you're unfamiliar with that. There's the parameter space, and there's also the data space, which is the set of possible data sets you could observe, and there's what's called the product space of those two, which is the set of possible parameters parameter values paired with possible data sets. And I think actually that most people who do Bayesian calculations, they think just about the hypothesis space or the, the, the H's that they're considering or the parameter space, and they don't often think about the data space. But I think it's best to think about the joint space of, of combinations of parameters with data, or in this case, combinations of which hypothesis is true with which data set was observed. Okay. So Bayes' theorem says that you know, once we've chosen all these numbers, we've, we've chosen probability of H and not H. So those would give us our two terms here for the numerator because we replicate that equation twice. And we've also got the probability of D given H. So we've got this, and we've got the probability of D given not H, which would give us the second likelihood, because we'd be replicating that equation twice. And so it turns out that all the inputs you need to calculate the probability of Ebola given the data and not Ebola given the data, all the ones we need are these two prior probabilities and this likelihood here, and this likelihood here in the third term there. 
So that's assuming that we've observed D, we want to update given that we know D, we want that to influence our, our thoughts about H and not H, and so those priors and likelihoods will go in there. Now it turns out that this number here doesn't come into the calculation at all, and neither does that number, and that's because these were about the probabilities of observing some data which is not the data that we actually observed. And there's a giant amount of statistics literature on the fact that those, that only two of these numbers enter the calculation, the ones that are to do with the data that we actually observed and not the ones to do with hypothetical alternative data. Those drop out and the term for that is the likelihood principle. So if you want to Google and read a lot of people debating about the likelihood principle and getting really confused about it and muddying the waters, then uh, there's plenty of reading about that. But anyway, only two of these numbers enter the calculation. So you can think of doing Bayesian statistics as you know, you're applying Bayes' theorem. You're applying two Bayes' theorem, uh, Bayes theorem twice, one for H and one for not H, but both given D and neither given not D, because not D isn't what we observed. But what I want to show you is a kind of common sense um, way of thinking that, that gives the same answer and lets you understand what the underlying idea is of the calculation. So it's very easy to plug those numbers into the calculation and do it, but here I want to show you what it is that's being implemented by that. So before we knew that D was true, we actually had four possibilities here. Four possibilities for pairs of hypothesis and data. And we can calculate using the product rule the probability of these four pairs, pairings of hypotheses with data. So for each one, we can go probability of H, so this is probability of H and D, that's the probability of H times the probability of D given H, that's the product rule. Probability of not H times D given not H, that's the product rule, product rule, product rule. So instead of thinking of there as being two hypotheses with probabilities that add up to one, we're now thinking of there being four possibilities of pairings of H's with D's. And these four probabilities all add up to one. Now it turns out that all the Bayesian update does for you is it says you've got these numbers, you had four possibilities, and then you learned that D was true, so what you're going to do is just get rid of anything that has D being false. So before knowing D, you had four possibilities, after knowing D, you only have these two. You kill off anything that has to do with D being false, because they're ruled out. You observe D, the positive test came. So those two ones I've highlighted in red are highlighted for deletion. You've got four possibilities. Then you learn that two of them are false. So you've only got two left. And the only problem with it is that you don't know, is that those two remaining possibilities are, uh, they don't have probabilities that add up to one. So that's the problem that we need to solve, and the way you solve it is just by normalization. So whatever these two things do add up to, you divide by them, and then you get two probabilities that do add up to one. So every example I show you today and every example of Bayesian inference that you ever see in any paper ever can be thought of as someone has enumerated a set of possible statements that might be true. They don't know which one is true. They're assuming only one of them is true. Then they've got some data, and the data killed off some of those hypotheses. So you delete some of them. And then what you've got left, you just maintain it. And all you have to do is, is uh, fix the fact that the prob probabilities no longer add up to one, but without changing proportionally how much more plausible one hypothesis is than the other. And so it's 
I think this is nice. You can just think of Bayesian statistics as just writing down what might be true and then deleting what's false. And everything else is just the kind of fancy stuff that you need to do when your sets of hypotheses are complicated. Yep. Little question. I got a bit confused on the, on the previous step. Um, yep. Your justification for using the product rule here. Yeah. Because you're, you're, the, you're so saying. So these are the product the, rule. Yeah, but to use. You're saying that the probability of the hypothesis and the data. Yes. Uh, are independent here. Um, no, these are not independent I because mean, this is the probability of H and this is the probability of D given H. So that's the, that's the general version of the product rule. So this is, D is the test saying that there was Ebola, given, given, given that it but really was Ebola. It's not shown on the left hand side, the given H, is it? Oh, okay. um, no, so the way I would write that out as an equation is, I would just expand it. So you just have this. Yeah, so it's just the numerator of, of Bayes' theorem. Yeah. Really. Okay. So I think that's nice. And one of the funny things about that is that I had no idea about that until uh, um, like a couple of years after I'd finished my PhD on Bayesian statistics. Everyone just looks at the, the, the set of hypotheses or the prior and posterior distribution on the parameter space, say, which if you don't know what I'm talking about, we'll come too soon. Um, and that's, that's kind of the best way, the best, the best place to look for actually applying Bayesian statistics, but it's not the best place to look for understanding it, I think. Um, so I was at a conference, Maxent 2009, in Oxford, Mississippi, and um, there was a guy there, I don't know if anyone here has ever been to a Maxent conference there. It's a series of conferences. It was founded by Ed Jaynes, who's written a very well-known um, bombastic textbook. And it's a kind of weird mixture of um, genius and cranks. Um, sometimes, so the guy I learned this from had some really out there ideas, but he also kind of crystallized something really fundamental for me, and I'm very grateful to him for that. Okay, so the moral of that story was that what we're implementing with Bayesian statistics is we're writing down a bunch of assumptions about what hypotheses we're considering and how likely they all are, and then deleting the ones that aren't true and, and maintaining what's remaining, that's all. It just seem, can seem more complicated because we have complex sets of hypotheses, more complicated than just um, two or four, as in this problem. So that's the end of the first lecture, or semi-lecture, if you want to think of it that way. Um, I've got a set of questions, and if you've cloned this repository, which I've called Madrid, if you go into questions, and then run make, it will compile all the PDFs, hopefully. And we've got questions1.pdf is the file that I would like to work on. And I think you can just do this with pen and paper. And question one is about just recognizing probability theory expressions. So I've got some equations, and I just want you to look at them and say, is that the product rule, is it the sum rule, is it Bayes' theorem, is it completely generic, does it apply to any hypotheses no matter what they are, or have I made some specific assumption like independence or mutually exclusive? If you get just used to staring at these kinds of things, it can be helpful. And then I've got two examples 
which are simple examples like the one about Ebola. So it's ones with some small set of hypotheses and a, a piece of data. And I just want you to calculate, given that piece of data, what's the probability of all those hypotheses, so all those posterior prob probabilities. And so question two is one of those examples, and question three is another one of those examples. But in question three, you actually have to assign some of the probabilities yourself. I don't just tell you what, what numbers to assume. So I think it uh, might take probably 15 minutes or so, maybe depending on how confident you all are. Um, but I'm happy to walk around and help people um, if you get stuck at any point, or if you want me to clarify anything. Um, feel free to ask. So, yeah, good luck with the questions.
Okay, hopefully uh, you got through at least part of the questions and I'd be happy to answer any questions about those at any other time, if, it, if you were having trouble or just didn't get through them all. Um, in this next lecture, I'm going to kind of not be Bayesian really. This is just a kind of statistics lecture, which is about probability distributions. So we started with probabilities. Those are ways of measuring how plausible certain statements are and how, and how to calculate what happens if you learn something, how does that affect your probabilities about something else. So that's Bayesian updating. In most applications, probability distributions are involved, and we actually had some in the previous examples, I just didn't call them that. And it's worth knowing what probability distributions are, what are popular families of probability distributions, and what some properties are of probability distributions, so things like the expected value and the standard deviation and, and stuff like that. What, what, what are those? Because those come up all the time. So a probability distribution is just another name for when you've got a set of mutually exclusive statements or hypotheses and you've assigned each of them a probability and those probabilities all add up to one. If you've written all that down, then you've written down a probability distribution. A discrete one, because in the cases we've looked at so far, the uh, set of possibilities is discrete. It's not like we're saying you could have any real number. Thank you. So here's an example, x some unknown x might be 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5, and we assign equal probabilities of 1 fifth to each of those possibilities. That's a probability distribution. So some terminology. When you have this kind of a situation, x is called a random variable. Now, I don't like that term. I don't use it very much because it kind of gives connotations that are a bit frequentist in a way that I don't like. So people usually think might conceptualize x as being a quantity that fluctuates. Like maybe x is 3 today and 5 tomorrow and 2 the day after. And if you look at a histogram of how often it was all those values, then maybe those would equal, you'd have one fifth for each proportion of those, uh, of those values of x. And that would be a frequentist or classical way of thinking about what a random variable is. More abstractly and more mathematically, x is just a random variable because we've written down probabilities for its different possible values. In a Bayesian case, x is still a random variable in the technical sense, it still has probability distribution, but the actual value of x is just a single fixed number. It's one of those five, and we don't know which one, and the reason we wrote down a probability distribution was because we don't know which one it is. There are different names for the space or the set of possibilities that X might take. So in most statistics literature, it'll be called the sample space. And the reason for sample space is that statisticians think of there being populations out there from which you draw examples and you look at them. And those examples that you see are the samples. So suppose there were a bunch of people out there, and I choose one, and I measure their height, then the sample space is the set of possible height measurements that I might have got. Okay. You can also just use the term sample space, just generically it just means the set, the set of possibilities, <laughs> that's all. So if you're in a Bayesian situation and these are hypotheses, you just don't know which is true, then you could call it the hypothesis space. It's just a set of possibilities. You could also call it the parameter space. If x was some model parameter of some model you were trying to fit to some data, and it's just the set of possibilities, but it has all these various names around the place. The probabilities that you specify are called the probability distribution. So in this case, this is a discrete uniform distribution. It's called uniform because all the probabilities are equal. 
and it's called discrete because it, the set of possibilities is discrete. So we have a, a countable list of probabilities. It might also be finite as well. And in this case it is. The way these are written down uh, mathematically is that often instead of explicitly listing all the probabilities, you might instead define how the probabilities, how these p's vary as a function of the x's. So what's this, what are these numbers as a function of those numbers? And written down as a formula. And the notation that you'll often see is the probability, so big P, that big X, my random variable, equals little x, one of these values, equals some function involving the little x. So you've often got in this notation, this is kind of the full notation that statisticians use and it's more mathematically precise, but it can be a bit annoying because there's a big X and a little x. The big X is the actual random variable and the little x is a dummy variable that lets you write down the right hand side as a function involving the dummy variable. So what's the probability that big X equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5? Well, that, as that varies 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that thing that's varied is the little x. So once you've specified a discrete probability distribution, there are some things you can derive from it. So single numbers that tell you something about the distribution. OK, so there's other properties, of course. I forgot this was in there. Normalization. So whatever the probability distribution is, assuming that all those possibilities in the sample space or in the hypothesis space are mutually exclusive and exhaustive, which they almost always are, then all the probabilities that you assign have to add up to one. And that's the normalization property. It's the sum over all the little x's running over this space of all the probabilities has to equal one. There is something called the expected value of x. And it's kind of an average. It's a probability weighted average of the possible values of x. So if I look at this, x might be 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5, but I, if I want to just kind of boil that all down to one number, say I wanted to just give a summary of roughly what I think x is, when all I really have is the probability distribution, then one way of doing that would be to give the expected value which is the average of these, but it's an average that uses the p's as the weights. So it would be the sum of that times that plus that times that plus that times that plus that times that plus that times that. And the notation for it, there's two. This first one is popular among statisticians. The expected value is capital E of x. And you can use the chalkboard font with the double line if you want, or you can just use a capital E. So expected value of x. And in physics, it's often written with the angle brackets, as I'm sure you've all seen in uh, quantum theory and statistical mechanics. It's the same thing. And its definition is that it's a summation over the distribution of x of each possibility times its probability. So the value of each possibility times its probability. Now, in the examples in the questions that you were just working on, so the question about the murderer who did the murder, there were three possibilities. There was Steve, Mike, and unrelated S, M, and U. And we had three probabilities for those three mutually exclusive um, pos uh, possible hypotheses. So we had a discrete probability distribution, and it satisfied normalization. But it didn't have because we never said that Steve corresponds to number one and Mike corresponds to number two and someone else corresponds to number three. So, so we didn't have numeric values for the, for the possibilities. So there's no expected value if, if you don't have numeric values for the possibilities. Okay. But usually there is, usually we're in a situation where 
our propositions are propositions about the value of a quantity, and so we have the expected value. The, there's also the variance, and the notation for variance is var of x, and its definition is that it's an expected value, but it's an expected value not of x itself, but of some function of it. And you can define expected values of any function of x. They'll look like this. There'll be a sum of the value times the probability, but instead of just having the value x here, it could be the value of any function of x, and that's also an expected value. So I could do the expected value of x squared if I just put x squared in the summation. And that kind of gives you the typical or the average value averaged um, with respect to these probabilities the average value of x squared. The variance is the expected value of x minus the expected value of x all squared, which is the squared distance of x from its mean, or from its expected value. So sometimes we speak sloppily, we say expected value, and we might also say mean, because it is kind of a mean, or an average. And the variance is basically the expected squared distance of x from its mean. So it has to do with the width of the distribution in terms of the values of x. So I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The expected value turns out to be 3 by symmetry. And the variance is something to do with how far x is likely to be from 3. But it's in units of x squared because it's got that squared in the definition. Okay, so it's an expected value, so it also is defined as the sum of the probabilities times the values, and you can also show that this equals the expected value of x squared minus the expected value of x squared. So that sounds like it would be zero, but um, one is the expected value of x squared, so x, the squared would be inside the expectation, and the other one so you'd be, have that minus the expected value of x squared, and in that case the squared is outside the expectation. So that's something you can prove just by expanding this squared and simplifying down what you get. So expected value tells you where the middle of the distribution is, and the variance tells you kind of the squared width of it. So these are just good numbers to very quickly communicate what a distribution looks like, and they also have nice mathematical properties as well. Because the units of variance are annoying, they're in units of the square of the variable, um, the standard deviation is, is usually a better number to, to communicate with. It's just mathematically more annoying because it's got the square root in the definition. So standard deviation is just the square root of the variance. And that just puts the units of the variance back into the units of the random variable itself. So I'm not sure what the actual value is in this case. I bet it'd be something like uh, of order 1. So basically saying that x is something like 3 plus or minus 1 would be one way of thinking about that, about what standard deviation means. So those are just two measures of the center and width of any distribution, and they pop up all over the place. Now there's another notation which is very popular among Bayesians, and it has to do with the fact that it's annoying to carry around the big X and the little X, so the name of the random variable and the name of its dummy variable, in all the equations that pop up in Bayesian statistics. So if you have some uh, problem with like 20 parameters in it and two data sets, then you might have all these symbols and you might have a big joint probability distribution, which I'll define later if you're not familiar with a joint distribution. And if you have to write every term with the big x and the little x and the big theta and the little theta and the big eta and the little eta, it gets really bad. So we have this other notation, which is actually more mathematically nonsense, um, but lets you write down equations really fast. And it basically takes this probability that big x equals little x and just writes it as little function p of little x. And the way you read little p of little x is that it's the probability distribution of x. Okay. 
And actually little p is not really a function because if I had a, a problem with a quantity x in it, I would write little p of x is the probability distribution of x and I'd write little p of y is the probability distribution of y and they're not the same function. Um, they're not the same expression of x and the same, the same thing just applied to y. They're just two completely different things, both written with little p and the way you need to read them is as the probability distribution of the thing inside. And you also get rid of the uppercase version, which is the actual name of the variable, and you just have the lowercase version all the way in your notation. So if I'm using this shorthand notation, little x will be the name of the variable, the random variable itself, or the unknown quantity that has a distribution, and when I write down equations involving its distribution, I'll write them as little p of little x, or as an equation involving little x. So the big X disappears. Because the big X disappears, you might write the expectation just as being the expectation of the little x, and just writing down this, which is the same thing as this, but in the more shorthand notation. Okay. There's mo even more simplifications you can make that are useful. So we've got here summation over all possibilities little x, and I've even just dropped that and put the sum, because in many cases in Bayesian inference there are sums and integrals that appear, and the sums are almost always sums over the whole set of possibilities. And so basically, any time I write a sum or an integral, it's implicit that it's over the whole sample space or hypothesis space, and it's usually obvious which one it is. So this one's the expected value of x, so it's going to be a sum over all x. Okay. How do we handle probability distributions in code? Well, discrete distributions of one variable are quite easy. You just have vectors. So whatever language you like to use, um, you could have a vector of x, which just contains these, and a vector of p's, which contains the probabilities. And so all the operations to compute uh, mean and standard deviation and things like that are, are just little functions you can apply to those two vectors. So here's an example of just a little bit of Python code. And um, if you want to run this, I'm using import numpy as np and I'm using import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. Hopefully that's standard enough. So I just made up a distribution where I've defined this. Uh, this is the grid of possible values or the set of possibilities or the hypothesis space or the sample space or the parameter space or the whatever, and I've called it x's. It's plural, the s is meant to be a plural, and that's just a habit that I picked up from learning Haskell, which is a kind of a brain bending language. But they have this convention that if you have a, a list or a vector, you call it x's, and then when you loop over it, you call each individual element x. And I just like that convention, so I've put it here. So x's is just, a re is just integers from 5 to 21, and I've just made some p's, probabilities, so this, these two lines just construct a probability distribution. So I've just set the p's are the x's squared. So I, I gave the distribution a shape. But then the x's squared probably don't add up to 1, so I've normalized it. And normalization of a probability distribution is the process that we had in the last section of normalizing to make the posterior probability sum up to 1. You can also just do that to any probability distribution that doesn't sum to 1 and you want it to, you just divide by what it actually sums to. And you can make a nice bar plot, which I think is the best way to look at discrete distributions like this. Now if you want to compute some things like the variance, the expected value, I've got the expected value of x, it's just the sum of x's times the p's, that product happens element-wise. So it's very concise and easy to do. The variance is the sum of the p's. The variance is, is an expectation, remember. So it's the expectation of this thing, the x's minus the expectation of x, all squared. So that's the variance. 
And again, that all happens element-wise, and then the summation happens last, and it's all good. And if you wanted to do the standard deviation, you could just take the square root. Now, another thing that's useful with probability distributions is that you might want to calculate the probability that, say, x is in some range or is greater than some threshold or, or whatever. And the way you do that is that you sum a subset of the probabilities that are in the distribution. So if I was working with this example and I wanted to know the probability that x was greater than or equal to 3, well, I would use the sum rule. So the probability that x is greater than or equal to 3 is the same thing as the probability that x is equal to 3 or x is equal to 4 or x is equal to 5. So we've got that logical or. Um, and those statements, greater than or equal to 3, is equivalent to the statement x equals 3 or x equals 4 or x equals 5. They're the same proposition. And because of that or, and the fact that these are all mutually exclusive values, x can't be 3 and 4, then we're just summing the appropriate subset of the probabilities. So you would sum that plus that plus that, and you get 3 fifths. So in code, if you're representing things with a grid like this, it's actually pretty straightforward as well. You just sum the appropriate subset. So in this case, if I wanted the probability that x is greater than or equal to 10, I just find the subset of the p's where x is greater than or equal to 10 and sum over that. So pretty straightforward. I'll get to continuous ones in a little, in a couple of minutes. Uh, in continuous distributions, instead of a vector of probabilities, you'll have a probability density function, which is a slightly different thing. It's just that what happens is that the, the hypothesis space becomes continuous, so you get infinitely many possibilities, and you can't define the probability of each of an infinite set of, of possibilities, so you define this probability density function, which is just the thing that lets you calculate probabilities by doing an integral. And everything that in the discrete case has a sum carries over to the continuous case and has an integral. And it's very easy to just switch back and forth between discrete and continuous. If I was doing a continuous version of this, everything that's a sum on this slide would just be an integral instead. And the p's would contain values of probability density function instead of probabilities. So there are standard families of distributions that exist. So these are parametric families of distributions, which just means that I might say there's such a thing as a uniform distribution, a discrete uniform distribution, but starting from what value and ending at what value. So that I had one going from 1 to 5, but I could have had one going from 3 to 10. And that would be a different distribution, but it would still be uniform. And you can talk and work abstractly with any, uh, with any uniform distribution with some lower limit and some upper limit. So it's called families of distributions. And they often come up in specific scenarios. And a good thing to get a feel for is what distributions come up in what scenarios. I've tried to give a few hints in these slides about what kind of situation is modeled by some of the popular distributions. So a discrete uniform is one I've looked at so far. And it's good for the situation where you just have some, some possibilities and you just don't know which one it is. So very common in situations like rolling dice and all that kind of typical stuff. Um, maybe not so popular in astronomy to have a discrete uniform distribution, um, but it's a very easy kind of distribution to work with. In fact, a lot of probability distributions that are more complex than the discrete uniform can actually be derived as... I've gone over time. OK, thank you. Um, can actually be derived as discrete uniform distributions on some other space, and then when you look at it in a certain way, it becomes something else. So I'll just finish through this list, and then we'll go have coffee. So there's binomial distributions, and those are for situations like, um, I'm going to repeat the same thing a bunch of times, and on each time I attempt to do that thing, there's a certain probability of success. So I might succeed or fail say every time I shoot a free throw at basketball. I might succeed or fail. 
if I imagine that there's a constant probability of success on each trial and then ask the question, how many times do I succeed? Then the distribution for that is binomial. So if you have n kind of quasi-identical trials, each of which has a certain success probability, then the binomial is about the total number of successes. And I wrote quasi-identical because if they're exactly identical, then you would succeed or fail on all of the trials. So they have to be different in some way. There's the Poisson distribution, and that's very useful for um, things where they kind of constantly might happen. So in any small time interval that something might occur, so you might receive a photon, say, and that's a very common astronomy example, use of Poisson distribution. How many photons will, I, will arrive in the telescope in, in this one second interval? If you think of in smaller time intervals than that, in every very small time interval, there's a certain very small probability, but you have a large number of intervals, um, and you're counting the total number of occurrences, you get the Poisson. Okay, so I think I'll stop there and we'll go do the coffee. Thanks.